for Vendetta. Buy the two disc collector's edition on Tuesday. The only verdict is vengeance. Go deeper into the most revolutionary film of the year with breathtaking special features. I'm ready. People should not be afraid of their governments. Governments should be afraid of their people. It's time. From the creators of the Matrix trilogy comes an uncompromising vision of the future. V for Vendetta. Buy a Tuesday on DVD. Day one, San Diego Comic Con, 10 p.m. Some of the best things that I heard from the day were uh, at the Master Replicas booth, which is uh, this company that makes replicated weapons. A dude was talking to another dude about a, a lightsaber that he had, a particular lightsaber that he had from the Star Wars films. And he had a uh, Luke Skywalker lightsaber. And he said, mine is even autographed by Mark Hamill. And that was just sort of a fucking run by that we heard that. And uh, I had to stop Cesar and laugh with him. Castle Crashers is an old-school arcade four-player hack-and-slash adventure. Uh, it's got elements of Golden Axe and Final Fight mixed with elements of Zelda and Guardian Heroes and Dynasty Warriors and anything... Uh, River City Ransom. River City Ransom, a big one. Um, you know, a lot of our old favorites, a lot of new elements, uh, a lot of on-screen effects, tons of magic and smoke and explosions, and item collecting and animal friends and horses. We saw the 
the game last year in a much more limited form. What, what's changed since then? Well, we redid all the art, and with that came, you know, redoing of the engine and things like that. We, after we got everybody's feedback, we kind of changed essentially everything. I don't think it plays much like the old version at all, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, and the other cool thing is we're mixing action with RPG, so you can now level up and gain abilities. If you gain magical abilities, you can apply um, different attribute points to your character for in different areas and things yeah. like that. Okay, so then what's, what's the story of the new game about? People take your stuff, your girls and your idol, and you go out and basically crash all their castles looking for it. Is you have you have your jab and your fierce slash, but you can make combos by going jab, jab, slash, and different variations of that. You also have a lot of air juggling, where once you have an enemy in the air, you can pretty much keep them up there for as long as you're able to keep juggling them around. Yeah. Then you have your magic, which uh, has variations of projectiles, close range, super jumps, uh, and magic slashes. And you can mix that into your combos, where you can you know super jump and slash an enemy into the air, then switch into a combo, and then on its way down, you can shoot a fireball down at them, you know, set them on fire. Yeah. So pretty much you can just punish enemies and once once they're dead you can you'll still knock them around you can knock off their head and still juggle their body around afterwards yeah. uh, we want it to be lots of chaos and fun everybody on the team has their own specific style of play we all like to do different things to the guys Tom usually has them way up in the air and I'm slamming them on the ground and things like that us about the Alien Hominid 360 version. Right now it's it's widescreen so you get a more playable area. It's you know better resolution so the graphics are looking better than ever. Uh, as far as announcing any additional levels or features right now that's unknown. Yeah. So we'll see where that goes. But like how far off are these games? So it's one six months away and one two years away or we right now we're hoping for holiday release for Alien Hominid and first quarter 2007 for Castle Crashers. Uh, nothing set in stone right now though. Right, nothing yeah. official, but we're not going to take our sweet time yeah. on it. So. It's really cartoony, but immediately reminded me, just watching it, of like the Ninja Turtles arcade game. Like they showed it last year on GameCube, and everyone was thinking, okay, this will be like a $50 game. So this year, 10 bucks is a lot of kids. Extremely cool. Yes, yeah, so they shopped it around for a little while, and then they basically looked at the live arcade angle, and they're like, hey, you know, we can do this without a publisher. Let's, it'll be way easier potentially more profitable because they get a big cut out of each set. Oh, as if Davis doesn't know it yet, but they bought me the Halo graphic novel today. <laughs> no luck yet on the Halo 2 action toy that you can see in my blog. I will have one. I need one. I need two, or three actually. One for me, one for Martin McDonald, and one for me to open and play with. That wasn't for us. I thought that we were about to be ejected from Arc -O -M -M. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna try and acquire a Master Chief helmet to bring back with me to Ziff. I think that it's the, I think it's one of those things that's missing from the offices would be me and Majolner armor. So when's the last time you played uh you played uh Kendor Tomorrow or Chaos Theory? I think the last time was with you. Like uh when you and I went on and played a couple of strangers. And we actually won Chaos Theory. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that was like months? months ago, though. Yeah, that was the last time I played. Oh, wow. It's been a while. I'm curious how see how this, how this turns out. Your mission is divided into three phases. Your mission is to prevent the intruder stealing two of the five. The yellow terminal is being attacked. The yellow terminal is being attacked. The 
Apollo terminal is being attacked. So I, I hadn't been following multiplayer as closely, like I didn't play Chaos Theory as much as, as you did multiplayer. So I hadn't been, I knew that they were making changes, but like now having played it, I'm kind of surprised. Like it, they're definitely forcing you to the way it was always supposed to be where the spies are defensive and the mercs are offensive. It's, to, it's really like pushing you towards that now. It used to be, like, the original design was we had these heavily powered mercenaries against these stealthy spies who are underpowered, but right. people just kind of figured out, like, they got really good people at People get so good at spies that, like, as a mercenary against a good player, like, I didn't stand a chance. Like, they'd yeah. be coming straight at me, and I would be afraid, and that was the opposite of what it was supposed to be. You know, they would, they would what, you, you did some of it, they would stun you, shoot a smoke grenade at I your feet. I learned this from some of my friends, yeah. yeah. Like, you stun them with a shotgun. And he could just do like a rapid fire. It's like you're playing Tony Hawk or Street Fighter. So like it's like boom, 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 and then you right. hit a smoke grenade, flashbang, and then a chaff grenade, and all in all in like within a second. Yeah. And you're the mercenary is just like I don't know what's going you're on. Strangling you're behind them and yeah. strangling them in a second. So you, basically, the spies in the old games like Pandora, Tomorrow, and Chaos Theory, the, the spies would just learn to take you out right, right. away. Then they have free reign in the levels. Right. So so now like you don't even have a gun as a spy. You yeah. don't have the stun gun anymore. Like you only have one gadget at a time. Um, it's it's weird. It's totally different. I mean, I, I think they definitely did it because the old game, like, is me even me as much as I love them. I didn't play it as much because it was so deep that the people who played it a ton were so good that the gulf between like a beginner and the, yeah. the experts was just ridiculous. Like, so much of the game was spy detectors and mines and placing them as mercs and, and spies, and now that's that's all gone. Right, like, right. the first thing I was like, wait, so no mines? And they're like, yeah, no mines, which is such I keep, a huge I keep thinking, thing. Like, the game's not finished. Yeah. I'm like, Oh wait, they're gonna put this in later. Yeah. But it's weird, yeah. Like so, the spies, they really took off, uh, took out a lot of their offensive powers. So you don't, they don't have the shocker gun. They don't have multiple grenades. It feels weird to stand up and just run through the levels as a spy, but I'm doing it now because it's like, oh, well, I don't have to worry about mines. I don't have to right. worry about trip wires. I can just like haul ass. If somebody sees me, I'm just gonna like try to run and escape and use more of your like acrobatic moves. Yeah, that's the thing. It's weird, like, because as a mercenary. I miss setting up the traps, like, all right, I'm gonna find a clever place to put the spy trap right, right. or a mine. But at the same time, I could appreciate like how much less frustrating this is as a spy. Because in the old game, even if you wanted to run, like you drop a smoke grenade as a spy, you take off, but then like you turn a corner and then you explode because right. they put a mine there. And it's for the mercenary, it's very rewarding. But as a spy, it's like, well, he didn't. That guy didn't even really kill me. All he did right, was right, set a trap, I that I, and I had to run this way no matter what. Right. So it's like they kind of took out that kind of impersonal, like a, I don't know for me, like it's. They, they want it more face to face. Like if you're gonna kill the spy, you have to see him and actually right. put a bullet in his head or drop a grenade in on him instead of just like killing him like anonymously as somewhere else on a level with a mine. Terminal is being attacked. I thought I thought it was also cool that uh, when you get killed, like to to your point, like sometimes you just die and it was from a mine. It was like, oh, why? Where was it or whatever? You know, you didn't even know. Now, even when you get shot, it has that thing where it shows and it shows the line of the bullet yeah, and it shows yeah thing. where yeah where the person was who shot you and and from what angle and you can switch back and forth between you and him. They want to make it easy for you to figure out like if, even if you're a spy, you're hacking, all of a sudden you get shot from behind and you don't understand why. So now you can see like oh the mercenary snuck up behind me. Right, right. So they so they want you to learn from it and next time like where well, I gotta watch my back yeah. or I gotta find another less obvious spot to hack the thing from. 
Yeah, there's a lot of little things in there that you can appreciate for, like for newbies. Like on top of that, you have the the mini map now in the corner, right. so you can always see, see what objective. Other guys yeah, are. you see where your teammates are. You yeah. see where the objectives are being hacked. So even so, you're not like wondering like like. What do I do? Like, what's going on? Who's hacking? That what? helps a ton. Yeah. yeah. Instead of just the HUD thing flashing, and you're like, uh, it's through some walls. Like, where is it? You yeah. know. The the other uh, cool thing I'm glad they added was so often like a spy would get away in the old games, and you were just like, oh, all right, maybe you call out to your teammate. But now you have that little drone you can send after them, and it's really cool, like chasing after someone in the drone or seeing a drone going after someone, or as you're a spy, oh, like kind of being hunted by one. Yeah. Yeah, and then you can self-destruct it, and I get and the, the controls on it are a little touchy, so it's not as easy as just like flying around in 3D space. It's yeah, like yeah. definitely a skill, like the bumpers you go up or down. So that took some getting used to, especially in like the low little crawl spaces. Yeah, because you have to keep covering it to move it yeah. forward. But it it is cool, yeah, because if they duck into a vent. Right. And you can't follow them, now you can send a drone in after them, so it's not quite over yet. So if you if you see the Merc while he's doing it, he's kind of like this, and he's looking at the stuff on his face plant. Oh, so, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so the, the trade-off is, if you see a Merc who's doing that, it's a good time to come up behind him and, and strangle him. Yeah, yeah. But I think, I think most, like, the hardcore fans, like all the guys I used to play with, I, I suspect they're not going to like this at first. Because right. I didn't like it. The first time I played it, I was, like, just bummed out, because I'm like, oh, man. Chaos Theory was so good, Pandora Tomorrow was so good, yeah. and I really missed having all the choice of gadgets because you, you had all these different gadgets to pick from and there's a lot of strategy. Right. You know, like, you can set up a spy bullet here so you can see when the mercenaries are approaching. Yeah, you it, can got, set up it got so, like, complicated and yeah. stuff like that. It's, it's pretty much them saying, like, yeah, we could continue to go and refine this really, you know, kick-ass multiplayer and have the small group of people that are really enjoying it, or we can kind of reset it. So. It's interesting they're doing that. The three-on-three -three thing, I think, is is a really good thing. Going with this strategy, if you're going to go this way, I'm glad they made it three-on-three -three yeah. now. Like, like, because it it is more fast action and arcadey, and and also it's less reliant. When it was two-on-two, -two, if one guy wasn't as good, like it totally threw off the entire yeah, game. True, now true. with three, it's just like a little bit easier to balance, like any yeah. given match. You know? I loved how deep the old games were, but it, and it's so much more shallow now. But at the same time, there's the, the po there are a lot of positives to these fixes. So right. I need to play it a lot more and see how it goes. Because like the original games too, like Chaos Theory and Pandora Tomorrow, you didn't realize how hardcore it was until you started playing other people. As people got good, right. that's when all the problems started popping up. All right, cool. So you want to head back in? I think we got one yeah, more we got map. Some more time. So let's play some more. All right. There is something terribly wrong with this country, isn't there? Cruelty and injustice, intolerance and oppression, and where once you had the freedom to object, to think and speak as you saw fit, you now have censors and systems of surveillance coercing your conformity and soliciting your submission. I know you were afraid. Who wouldn't be? War, terror, disease? Fear got the best of you, and in your panic you turned to the now High Chancellor Adam Sutler. He promised you order, he promised you peace, and all he demanded in return was your silent, obedient consent. But if you see what I see, if you feel as I feel, and if you would seek as I seek, then I ask you to stand beside me, and together we shall give them a 5th of November that shall never, ever be forgot. We're uh, out in front of the AMPM again, a little product placement, day two, the San Diego Comic-Con. 
Uh, we had 90 minutes this morning from the time the show started to get there to enter the drawing for the Halo 2 action toys. And uh, we regrettably were unable to participate in the raffle due to uh, me oversleeping. Any pressure intrinsically to continue to innovate with the franchise, and how do you continue to how do you plan to continue to innovate going forward? So Castlevania series, series, for twenty years, I've been doing it. So, I've been doing it for twenty years. 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 別なことを取っていくのかっていうところでいつもあの考えるところはあるんですけれども、まあ、っていうゲームを作るということは商売ですからとにかくその今までと違うキャッスルバニアっていうことをあの考えながらやってますのでどちらかというとそのコアファンに対するプレッシャーよりもその新しいものをっていうそういう意欲でものを作ってるというような感じですよね。There's two characters in the New Castlevania title. Is there any multiplayer functionality plan for the game? 今回はですねあの本編中のゲームではちょっと用意し,してないんですけれども、えー、w i f i コネクションとあとワイヤレスの2つのモードで、えー、協力モードを用意しています。The first thing I want to talk about, guys, is the process of creating for print versus the process of creating online. I mean, a lot of it is parallel for creating for something like Halo 3 and creating the Halo graphic novel. Because, what are some similarities and differences between the two, though? Well, I mean, it, it, I actually have a print background, so I was used to both both disciplines, I suppose. But you're right; there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of concepting, there's a lot of planning, and there's a lot of you know early iterations and and. You know, a lot of working with artists, which is much of what making a real video game is about, as well as obviously the Halo graphic novel. The book is essentially official canon. This is really Bungie's baby, and there's a lot of stuff in there. Like even in the first story, you you find out that when the flood takes over a creature, it also gains that creature's memories and thoughts, which is something we hadn't necessarily known previously. And there's lots of these little nuggets and treats inside the book. What else is inside there for fans to to pour over? We came up with the initial concepts for the stories and then handed off. You know, very vague and broad outlines to the writers to say, "Here's this, here's this concept. We'd like you to flesh it out." Uh, they'd write something, come back with uh, versions of it. We'd edit and iterate on those and say, "Actually, that's not true," or maybe you could add this. The stuff that fans are probably going to be excited about is stuff that we probably take for granted. Like we knew that's how the flood biology operated, and you know, we forget that sometimes that stuff isn't definitely obvious or clear in the game, but it's in our canon and it's in our story bible. So yeah, I mean, it's like. There's probably a thousand things in the in the graphic novel are going to surprise or excite fans of the series. In Halo One, the Flood are just these zombies that just come in mass, and they seem like they're just fodder. 
In Halo 2, when players sort of get exposed to this thing called the Grave Mine, they start to maybe realize that there's more to these guys than meets the eye. So, um, we, the graphic novel is a great way for us to just expand on that and get people more insight into the Flood because they've they're playing a greater role now in, in the sort of the Halo saga. So we wanted people to really understand that. These are pretty serious, scary guys, and they're not just, just zombies, so... Halo, the way that I'm seeing how Bungie is presenting it, is the story of a universe. It's a fiction that's confined beyond just, you know, Master Chief and Cortana's story. There's a lot more here, and the graphic novel's really sort of expanding on that. If you look at the, you know, the back of the box of Halo 1, you might get the idea that it's uh, Master Chief versus the Covenant. And really, the Master Chief's struggle with the Covenant is what reveals this bigger, greater, darker, more ancient threat in the form of the Flood. So it's never really been as, as black and white as that. There's always been, uh, you know, a, a lot more depth to the, the kind of struggles that both the Covenant and the humans have to fight now. You know, the, the Flood doesn't care whether you're human or Covenant. The, the, the Flood is going to consume and use your species. So uh, certainly that's something that uh, we left kind of a cliffhanger in Halo 2, and it's something obviously we're going to expand upon and elaborate on in Halo 3. I am your shield. I am your sword. I know you. Your past. Your future. I think the games do a really good job of telling the Master Chief story. And things like the novels, graphic novels, these ancillary products, definitely our goal is to just widen everything because we introduce characters like Sergeant Johnson that people really love and they you know, really gravitate to. So we'd have a whole Johnson story in here where people can learn a little bit more about Sergeant Johnson and you know, as an example, he's probably a character you're going to be hearing more about in probably future published works as well. That we like him a lot and we want to leave Master Chief sort of, he's going to be the guy in the game and these are great ways to sort of talk about the other characters and, and just open up new avenues for Halo. Halo 3, you've said, you said in the documentary, is the conclusion of, it's the finishing of these fights. From that, I mean, I wonder if this is the end of a, of a particular, like, fictional arc. It's not just a way, you know, to separate, you know, the core game universe from the rest of the universe. If you look at the Mobius uh, strip in the Halo graphic novel, it, it actually is designed to explain something from Halo 2 very clearly, which is, New Mombasa is completely deserted and it's this weird ghost town and it's a very strange place when you're in the game and we wanted to say this is what it's like when it was populated and there were real people lived here and there were real casualties in this war it didn't just magically evacuate and everyone was safe and happy you know it's like we're gonna have this huge collection of canon and, uh, and things that we embrace as canon like I love bees and stuff like that and just say this was the universe and that, that's not to say it's all going to come to a dead stop. We've always looked at Halo 1, Halo 2, and Halo 3, the games, as one cohesive trilogy. Where it goes from there and where other tangents pop up, who knows? But obviously we got a lot of people that love our universe. We have really cool characters, uh, a lot of great stories to tell. So we're looking forward to, to doing all we can. We want all that stuff to be vital, expansive detail that, that helps it, you know, illustrate our universe better. I get a lot of questions on my blog about how I went up, how I went up goes so hard all the time. This is the secret. See this? See you know what this is? This is victory. Luke won. Comic Con Zero. This is what we came for. I mean, and the games. But this is what we're here for. My ODST exclusive toy. Now, this isn't the only one I have. I have three. Three tickets, three winners. 100% batting average. We'll be going back tomorrow to try and get more. Uh, greed has set in. I have to give two of my three toys away. And uh, I, I need more. In Lyon, as soon as we get there, I'm like, dude, I have to go. We have to use these. We have to get these tickets. And he's like, okay, but as soon as we're done, we've got to go over to the darkness. I mean, he's always so serious. Go over and interview Starbreeze. <laughs> Fucking all business, no pleasure. Dick. What's, what's the feedback you're getting from the Comic-Con fans on, on the demo you're showing here? Uh, it's like... Uh, 
pretty good feedback. It's it's fun to be here at Comic Con and see all the the people that are interested in comic coming in, seeing the game, and getting really excited about it. Are you looking for feedback on say like like the license and if the fans think it's true to the the comic book? Yeah, yeah. To a big extent, we saw the this is the same demo on E3 a couple of months ago, and it was computer press related. So we got some feedback from them, and it's a completely different story here with what people are interested in and what they want to see. So. Listen to your Uncle Paulie, Jackie. Now put him down, nice and slow. It's a chance for us to go and, and meet uh, the people that read the comic a lot, and it's a good, good place to, to talk about the game. Any like particularly memorable comments you're getting from the crowd that, that you might take into like the feedback of the game? Um, no, but we had, for, for instance, a guy that came in and he, he told us he was the biggest Darkness fan and he, he looked all sour throughout the whole show and after, afterwards he went out and he gave us a nod, so a nod of approval. So. <laughs> We're here outside the Halo graphic novel panel, which just let out with Alan Duhamel, who, in a sea of super fans, asked by far the most difficult questions of the Halo of the, the guys on the panel. Who asked 343 Guilty Spark about who asked them first when they were activating Halo? In First Strike, uh, and they find the crystal, and it takes that crystal and the power of 50 Covenant warships in order to shunt them into the alternate version of Slip Space. And how, I was wondering how the had the three shards, like this big, how they could have, with the power of one warship, have the power to deflect Mac gun rounds. <laughs> that was, I, my love of Halo has been quelled. This is a gentleman who likes it more. So much that you actually made stuff out of Legos with Halo. Did you want to show us what you, what you created, what you brought with you to the show today? Hopefully it's, yeah, see, still together. So what, do, what now? What is this here? This is the this is the MA5B assault rifle from Halo One. I'm being told it's coming back in Halo Three. I've also made a shotgun, and in a couple of days I'm going to be working on a rocket launcher. Thank you very much for sitting down and talking with us. Well, I appreciate it. Welcome. We're just checking out Comic Con, uh, getting a good sense of it. It's really cool. There's a lot of comic book fans and game fans and uh, could you even made like a two minute appearance yesterday any, you know what he looked at any uh, any word did you, did you see him did you spot him I did not but we heard after the fact did you hear I mean you should see uh, there's some pictures on the web I mean he's he's ripped now he's been working out and uh, it looks like he could beat anybody any of these fans up all the cosplay like man you got snakes patch on the wrong eye 
confused. All right, but you guys are showing, showing Lunar Nights. It's a little bit updated from what we've seen before, right? right? We got Lunar Nights, and we've got the digital graphic novel, which is already released, of course. But you know I like to pimp that as much as possible. Uh, yeah, so Lunar Nights, we've got updated build. How far are we off from seeing that game in stores? Well, we're actually we're, in, we're right about on the, the brink of crunch, crunch time. So right when I go back to Japan, we're going to start Stop doing, slacking on vacation. No more, no more slacking. No more going into work at 3 p.m. Like some people, I know I one up. <laughs> okay. We got the inspiration from PSP first. Okay, let's make to some the puzzle music game. And uh, yeah, I told him, you know, okay, let's make the puzzle music game first. And uh, Hattori, okay, uh, we will make uh, some few experiments. And uh, we had no office at the, at the, at the time. <laughs> <laughs> now I called to Hattori yeah. one day, so where you now? Uh, I'm in a karaoke box. What? 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 <laughs> you, you sing a song at the daytime? <laughs> so, no, 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 we have meeting. What, what kind of meeting? So, the luminous meeting. What? 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 try to come up with the uh, structure which would fit with the hardware. For example, uh, Luminous Live is, uh, uh, the concept is like a TV broadcasting, you can broadcast uh, new skins and you know, you change the skins all the time and then theme uh, skin may be coming and new artist skins are coming. Whereas Luminous 2 is like a party, right? I mean, right. you know, he's a, a you know, uh, DJ or party organizer, and then you are the party participants, like a big, big show. Yeah. And whereas mobile phones, like a little bit like accessory, and then so it's 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 a different kind of approach uh, for the uh, uh, old platform. So there is a one uh, a puzzle game that we are reviving, uh -huh. uh, which is uh, Gunpei mm -hmm. for Bandai. Uh, Gunpei is a, a kind of puzzle game. Yeah, we did the uh, PSP and DS. Oh. But completely in a, a, a different approach. Oh yeah, like a DS approach and PSP yeah. approach is completely different. Yeah. So if you're a big good day fan, you could actually, and you have a DS and PSP, right. you could you could buy both right. and have and still have a different different right. experience. Right. The Yokoi Gunpei, uh, Mr. Yokoi, um, he was uh, the the key member of Nintendo. Yeah, he created a Game Boy. Yeah, 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 Game Boy, and. Um, so he created Gunpei, the game, the puzzle <laughs> game. And uh, so we revived Gunpei with the music. Interesting, making a game named after yourself. I know, that's like... You know, like a Tetsuya, huh? <laughs> yeah, or, yeah. It's a good Tetsuya. Think so. about it. <laughs>
全然連絡なくて「ふざけんなよ」って電話したら「なんか今ちょっと面白いゲーム見つけて仕事やってなかったごめん」とか言ってで怒ったんだけどちょっとやりたくなって「送って」って言って。たら僕もハマっちゃって、向こうも仕事やっぱやってくれなくて、面白いだろうって言って、ああ、だよなって言って、まあ、あのちょっと、その時にちょうどうちの会社のミュージックインタラクティブっていう方針で、いろんな、例えば、ルミネスの元になったものとか、メテオスの,もの元になったのとか、例えばその前には僕、軍兵の今の企画とかも,も書いてて、ちょっとその仕事をやってて、ああ、もうこれ遊んでたけど、ちょっと、その。これを元に企画を書いたら仕事やってたのと一緒だから企画書を書こう。Now when you talk about technology and new new ideas and new and new experiences, what do you think about like the Nintendo Wii? Does that look interesting? And the Nintendo DS is so popular in Japan. I know you guys are working on the new medios for for that. Let's say you designed Space Channel Five mm -hmm. today, you know, and it didn't exist before. Right. You know, you could use the remote control to like, you know, ooh la la, yeah, saying like, <laughs> like that. You could actually use the controller <laughs> like that. You know, I'm curious, like, what you guys could do with that as a, right. as a from game design perspective. What's your thing? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. You, you are touching the <laughs> big point. <laughs> Even as, oh, boy, okay, here's comes the sh here comes the enemy, right? right? And you want to shoot them. So instead of like aiming with the analyst, right. you could shoot them. Well, I mean, yeah. we can't disclose too much information, but, but you're right. He is mentioning a lot about a res, you know. It's a critically uh, a, a really a successful, but it didn't really work out commercially. We talk a lot about it, and if, was it the right product or wrong product? You know, the uh, conclusion is like maybe you know uh, the stage was wrong, and yeah. you know we need to have the right stage to show. So uh, I know. wish that you guys actually owned the rights to Res, mm -hmm. because if you did Res now, mm -hmm. oh man. We're here at Joyride Studios, the thing that we came for. Luke Smith's Master Chief Halo 2 ODST, Master Chief Spody Toy, getting it. Hit Cesar, let's go. I hear the boss go for the boss. Oh, okay, alright. Here's what I want to know.